My friend and a, a person who actually got involved in this industry back in, when he was 15 years old, he started listening to, to information that changed his life, that changed his parents' life. His parents have been in this and in, in this environment, and he, it's uh, and he's been in an incubator. Okay, and here we are. He's 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 uh, developed over time, and about at age 21, he he hatched into a successful. Uh, entrepreneur, he was able to retire from his uh, from his job, and for the past 11 years, he has spoken to thousands and thousands of people on how to have freedom and how to actually have successful businesses in this this time that we're in, which is a little bit different than the time that our parents grew up in. So his parents too, and. Uh, so he's, he's worked with thousands of people, and he's, he's, he's consulted with many people in the industry and uh, developing business system, and here he is tonight. We're very lucky and proud to have Mr. Rod Robson! All right. Well, hey, I am so excited to be with you tonight. I, I'm, I'm so fun. I got to meet a lot of you. Brand new. Just checking things out tonight. How, what an exciting time. This company just launched 11111. Now you get to be here on the ground floor of what is revolutionizing education. I am so excited because what, what I believe what we have today is uh, it, it really the stars of a line to create I feel as close to a perfect of a business opportunity that's ever been. Uh, I've been around this industry for a long time. I've worked with a lot of different companies, the top leaders in, in helping develop leadership development training systems, and, and we've seen what works and what doesn't work. I'm going to talk about three topics tonight. We talk about you know Michael Dell's content, commerce, and community. My dad talked about it. I want to talk about purpose profits and power player and how those three areas the the uh, purpose of what we're doing why we're doing it profits of how we monetize that create wealth and power player is our master strategy how we can put those three things together when i think about the purpose you know one of my favorite quotes is by a motivational speaker i'm sure you've all heard of zig ziglar you you've seen, he's so dramatic he's got that texas drawl and one of my favorite quotes is you are who you are what you are and where you are by what you've chosen to put into your mind he always says that. He says, you might not like where you are today, but you chose to get there. You are who you are, what you are, and where you are in life by what you've chosen to put into your mind. But therefore, you can change who you are, what you are, and where you are in life by changing what you put into your brain. This example does those little dramatic things. I love <laughs> but, uh, One of my favorite guys to watch. Yeah, I remember hearing that for the first time going, yeah. I, I didn't. I thought that I was a victim. I thought somebody else chose where I am today. But he's telling me that it's it's my choice by what I've chosen to put into my mind. He said another quote that, that goes right along with it. He says, there's no such thing as a self-motivated person. And, and I've met a lot of people that told me they were self-motivated. Right? They come up to me at the end of a business plan like this and they say, look in my eyes. I'm your next leader. I'm going to pass you. And I'm like, ooh, we got one. Right? Mm -hmm. I call him up on Tuesday for our follow-up meeting and he died. Right? I, I, he's still alive, but he died in my book. He's gone. He, he hides. Right? He won't re answer his phone. What happened to that guy? He was all fired up. Talked to his brother-in-law who informed him, don't you remember you always pick last for kickball? Don't you remember that you're, you know, that you're not good at things? Don't you remember that uh, you, you've never been a champion in your life? What makes you think you can win at this? There's no such thing as a self-motivated person. Only those who are willing to put themselves into an environment that's conducive for winning. What environment are we in? And we choose it, right? So we, we choose where we are, who we are, who we are, what we are, where we are, and it by really by our environment. It, it's our environment. And so I'm, I'm proud of all of you for being here tonight. And you know, around the country, around North America, there's literally somewhere 20, 30,000 people meeting in rooms, hotels, and, and um, different venues all around North America on a Tuesday night right now learning about these principles, learning about this revolution. And we just, we, we've been in business about eight days, so it's fired up. Right? That's, that's pretty fired up. So why is it important? Why is it important that we provide that environment for people? That's what we're doing, is we're, pro we're providing the right information. We're <laughs> providing the right environment. Well, I believe that, there is a, that there, there's a real serious importance to this, and it, it's why I wake up in the morning so excited about what I do. People, you know, we're, we're, we're hustling pretty hard at this. A lot of people will say, man, you're working, burning the candle both ends, you're working pretty hard. I wake up every day feeling called, 
knowing that I'm doing what God called me to do. Because I believe that there is a war going on. There is, there is a war called the media war. And, and it is, it's a war of defining worldviews, of, of how we believe about how the world is. You know, you'll end up in, in some place in life based on really your worldview. And your worldview is created by your associations, your environment, because you've chosen an environment that was conducive for winning or for losing or for being a victor or a victim. You, we choose that environment, and there's this war. And I'll tell you, we have been losing the war for quite some time. There's only a few people, there's a small, small few people that believe a certain way. Uh, they, they believe in, in big government and small people. I was just talking to my good friend Holly back there who's uh, in, in taking her constitutional law class in law school right now. She's talking about the founding fathers. How the founding fathers, they believed the opposite. They, they wanted big people and small government because that way, that way the, the people could be independent, the people could be sovereign. But, but now if, if, you, if, if you want to have control, man, big people and small government is definitely not the way to go. If you want to have control, you want to have big government, small people. You want to have minions, right, uh, that, 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 that do, you know, do what they're told to do. And so there has been a, a um, progressive worldview progressing towards that end uh, since the early 1900s and they've been doing a really good job at it and you know they're not it's funny they're not hiding people sometimes will say man it sounds like you know it sounds like you're talking about a conspiracy theory I said well it is a conspiracy it's not a conspiracy theory it's a conspiracy fact right and they're and they're pretty open that they're conspiring uh, what, one, of, one of the earliest quotes that I really like by a guy who was the first leader of the UN's World Health Organization George Brock Chisholm Good guy. I mean, first leader in, 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 uh, when the UN got started. Back, uh, this was a talk at the Conference, uh, Conference of Education 9 11, 1954. And he said, To achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, loyalty to family tradition, national patriotism, and religious dogmas. So that's, that is a, that's just what we need to do. And they weren't, this is a Conference of Education. So how do we do that? How do we enforce these things to be able to create? Big government, small people. That's the focus. It really comes down to, in order to take away somebody's rights, Karl Marx, one of my favorite people, to, he's just so pure ideology, ideologically, meaning he has a lot of integrity in what he believes. Right? He, he, he did what he said he was going to do, and, uh, and, and, and people since then have been less, you know, less specific, uh, less, uh, they, they, they've, they've tried to hide behind different uh, ideals and, and different cute phrases. Pretty much this Marxism idea has, has been perpetuated for quite some time, not the one that started it, but the whole thing, if you read one of my favorite books, The Naked Communist, really good book by Cleon Skousen, and he talks about in there that Karl Marx wasn't so much about uh, socialism and communism, before he was about atheism. Because see, there's this whole, there's this, this, this crummy thing called facts that uh, when, you, when you, these pesky little things called facts, that when you figure out uh, where our rights come from, it, it, you don't allow someone else to take them. Because if we believe in natural rights, like our Constitution and, and Declaration of Independence talk about, that our rights come from God, right? If they come from God, then no man can, uh, can take them away from us. Because what is government is just a combination of men and women to protect those rights that, that we all individually have. Therefore, government couldn't have any rights that the individual doesn't have. And because we, we're going for small government, big people, right? But if you want the opposite of that, then there's some ways you go about that. One of the, what, you know, he wrote a book you can read uh, uh, for, for his whole his manifesto for destroying our type of establishment of society, right? So he, he's got it down. His 10th plank, final plank, was a really good, good one. He said that free education for all children in public schools uh, was one of the most important things that he, that was the 10th plank. Why? Why is it so important? He said, well, this is a quote by Karl Marx. He said, it is capable of exact demonstration that if every party in the state has the, has the right of excluding from public schools whatever he does not believe to be true, then he that believes most must give way to him that believes least. And he that believes least must give way to those that believe nothing at all, no matter how in minority the atheists and agnostics may be. Right? So the whole thing is... Everything's about political correctness. What does political, political correctness mean? Well, we can't talk about morality because whose morality are we talking about, right? We all have different ideas of morality. So the only morality we can talk about in a, in a, in a public school or, or in a public sec sector would be amorality. No morality, right? That's the only morality. That's the only thing that's acceptable because we can't. Wait, what if that guy doesn't believe in morality? 
what, you know, what if he doesn't believe in the Ten Commandments? What if he likes to kill people and commit adultery? I mean, you don't want to offend people like that. And so, so now we've created a society that does exactly what a nice Mr. Chisholm from the United Nations had said that we need to do, is take away from the, the tradition of our family values, attack those, attack the idea of liberty and freedom, and focus on, no, 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 your rights don't come from God. They come from government. We're the big government. You're the little person. So we're going to give you rights. We're going to allow you to do certain things as long as you behave. Right? So that's, that's the just general, general worldview. Not the, the point is, the point isn't whether you agree with this or not. The point is that we're all being brainwashed daily. Right? Every day we're being brainwashed. And you're not going to be able to avoid that. Today I'm not talking about not being brainwashed. We're planning on brainwashing too. Right? It, it's just what we're trying to do is being very, very open and, and uh, help you understand that you get to choose who washes your brain. Right? You, can, you get to choose the program. Right? It, it's, uh, you know, this guy went into the doctor's office one day and the doctor said, uh, or the guy said, I got a cold, I just can't kick it. And he goes, oh, listen, take these two pills and you'll be fine. Just while you're taking them, do not think about dancing monkeys, and you'll be fine, right? Guy goes home, keeps taking the pills, right? But the more he tries to not thinking about dancing mon not think about dancing monkeys, the more those monkeys keep on dancing, right? He can't not think about it. And so what happens is that we you can't dilute, or excuse me, you can't erase the negative programming. You can only dilute it, right? You you you, you we've got that negative programming in there, and, and but it, and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of you know if you want to. If you want to plant something of any value, if you're a farmer, it's a lot of work, isn't it? You got to plan the right time, the right crop. You got to you got to make sure it's watered properly. You got to plow the field. Now, if you want to plow weeds, it's no work at all, right? It, it's you don't have to do anything. You just if you do nothing, you're a great weed farmer, right? It'll, it, you, and so what happens is you don't. You, most people think pretty negatively because you don't have to do anything to think negatively. You're naturally negative. Right? I asked your wife. That's what she told me. You're naturally <laughs> negative. What we have to do if we want to change our thought process to start believing that the great thing can happen in our life is we have to change the programming. We have to daily focus on planting. Daily focus on plowing, watering. It, it, has, to be, it, it has to be intentional. That's why life, the acronym, is living intentional for excellence. It, excellence doesn't happen naturally. Weeds happen naturally, right? And so that, that's the whole focus around life is allowing people the alternative programming, the, the alternative brainwashing, right? They just don't, they, and they don't know that they're even being brainwashed. But it is so, it is so apparent once you can unplug. And the government's got, the, not the government, it's not the government that's doing this. It, the, 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 it's really a small group of people that believe a certain way. It's a worldview, right? And, and it's amazing how oftentimes people who become billionaires, when they were millionaires, they were free market entrepreneurs, and for some reason, as soon as almost everybody gets the billionaire label attached to them, they become socialists. They, they, be, they become, they, they become the, the thought process is, well, they're so valuable, they're so good, that it must be unfair, and they need to take care of all of us. Right? They need to have big government and small people and make sure that they take care of all of us Some, somehow. So, so the focus is, what are they doing? What are their, what are their weapons? Right? And, and one of the biggest weapons, in addition to into promoting atheism and, and, and attacking the family, is finance. Right? We, we are a debtor nation. We are, a, we are debtor individuals and a debtor nation. And all this happened, one of, one of my favorite CD packs, um, Economics and Your Money, one of, the, one of the first packs that we recommend through the life, uh, one of the life products, has some CDs in there that you will that blow you away if you're not really familiar with this. There's one called The Camel in the Tent by Chris Brady that talks about the history of economics and why it matters. Why it's so important to understand monetary policy. I, I remember first hearing mon about <coughs> monetary policy going, who the heck cares about monetary policy? But see, what happened is that, that, that back in the, back a long, long time ago, we didn't have money. We bartered, and so I would do something. I would grow my crop, or I would train a horse. And if I was a good horse trainer, and you wanted a horse, then and you grew berries, then you tried to trade your berries for my horse. But if I didn't want berries, and what, uh, you say, well, what do you want? Well, I want salami. <laughs> now you got to go to the butcher 
and trade your berries for salami, and then bring the salami back to me to, to get my trained horse, right? You, so it becomes very complicated, so they created this thing called money. And money was just a store of value, a receipt of service. You did a service for me, here's something that instead of giving you berries, because that's not as, as usable, and it's hard to carry a lot of them, right, and messy and all that, so uh, instead I'll give you a little receipt that this is good for a certain amount of berries. And, and then that, the, that receipt was gold and silver and honest money, things that held value. And then back in the early 1900s, and, well, even before that, but there's a whole history that you'll learn about in the history of economics, why it matters, Camel and Tent. Uh, it talks about the history of how people started, people that believed this idea of big government and small people figured out that they could just create twice as many receipts as there was service, right? So that you only gave them this many berries, they gave you a receipt, and then they said, well, why don't we print twice as many receipts? And they created this thing called fractional reserve banking. That's a really great idea if you're the guy fractionalizing things, right? <laughs> and it, work, it works fantastic, but it works kind of like the stock market. If you own 100 shares in a company, if there's 100 shares in a company that's worth $1,000, how much is each share worth? Ten. Ten bucks. What if we split the shares? Now we got 200 shares. How much is each share worth? Five. 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 Well, that's what happens when they created this thing called fractional reserve banking and then in 1913 created this awesome thing called the printing press at the Federal Reserve that says we can just print it. This is awesome. Now why do they keep taxing us if they, if they can just print it? Well, because if they don't tax us, the jig would be up, right? The scam would be over. We'd realize they just print it, right? But plus it adds an extra <coughs> layer of control to create a glass ceiling. It doesn't allow people to create success uh, by focusing on, on taxation. Anyway, here, here's the point. This isn't a political seminar. I just want you to know there is a plan, and you are being brainwashed. And I want life is all about is allowing people to choose the programming. And what we've done is we've taken this movement of, of liberty, of freedom, of, of teaching people about family and faith, teaching people how, how to have friends, how to connect with people, how to how to how to realize that they're big, they're not small, that they, they don't need a government to take care of them that they can take care of themselves and others. They can lead. By focusing on that, we've taken this movement, a concise system of re-educating the masses, and then we've monetized it. And I'm going to talk about the profit side. But we've monetized the movement, which has given it horsepower and allowed this, this whole work to be spread nationally and then internationally. Right? It is absolutely awesome. So that's, that's really, in my mind, what the purpose is. As I got to know Orrin Woodward and Chris Brady and why my parents and why Kenyon and I and why the leaders come from the industry who decided to partner up with Orrin and Chris is because we found out what their purpose was and I didn't even have a purpose like that. I didn't even know that I was supposed to, right? And when I learned about it, I became impassioned with the truth. I mean, it's tr truth is sweet to the ears, and, and, and I just know that if we can get it out to the masses, we can change things. There's no political savior, Republican or Democrat, I guarantee. As long as the people want stuff and will trade their liberty for security, that they will get politicians that will give it to them. Stuff and bondage, right, all in one package. And we can, we can say, no, you know what, we're about... Big people, small government, and, and you, have to, you have to create big people, though. If you shrink the government and the people are still small, they're still helpless. They will starve and revolt, and there will be fires and violence in the street. And, but, we, but if we can raise up an army of leaders, of, of tribal leaders, of people that will go out into their community and te do what Oliver DeMille talks about in his book, The Freedom Shift. He says there's three keys to change in the world. Three keys. First of all, First of those keys is we have to create a revolution in entrepreneurs. He talked about how <coughs> any major freedom shift around in history is created by only one and a half to two and a half percent of the populace. One and a half to two and a half percent. And we can create a freedom shift if we'll have one and a half to two and a half percent of our country being successful, financially independent entrepreneurs. Right? Engines, absolutely. Right? That's what we have. Number two. Number two, he said you have to create that same percentage of voracious readers, learners, independent thinkers that aren't hijacked by a political party or money game, but understand the principles. And they learn instead of instead of getting put onto the, the train tracks of, of the, the rut of how they want us to think of a conveyor belt education, grow, going into a leader that teaches you what to think, going into a leadership <coughs> education that teaches you how to think. 
right? So that's the number two thing we have to create. What do I have to do? I talk to some people, they go, man, I don't know if that business is going to do that well. I, people don't like to read. See, that's where it's going to do really well. See, people will pay you, like my dad said, people will pay you in life for the value that you create, the problems you solve in society. And when the people don't read, it, they, have no, they have no position over those that can't read. Right? And so we're going to create a community. We've created a culture of tens of thousands of people around North America that read a, a, a book a month, a book every couple of weeks, a book a week. Right? Thousands of people. This is a learning culture, a learning environment. You're going to do it the rest of your life. People said, when are you going to run out of books? When are they going to run out of TV shows? Right? As long as they're, as long as they're fighting, they're fight, we're going to fight ours. Right? We, we, we've got we, out there. So that's the purpose. Right? And I, I hope you see that we can make a difference. The third thing is, first one was entrepreneurs, re entrepreneur revolution. Second one was a learning revolution. The third one was creating tribal leaders, people that will go and develop other people and help them become a one, a two, and a three. Successful entrepreneur, independent thinker, and a tribal leader themselves. This has, life has been set up with the whole focus to do just that, and you get to be part of it.